Imagine it's the dead of night, somewhere in the vast, pine-choked forests of Sweden. A lone truck driver, following orders, pulls over on a deserted highway. Within minutes, a team of conscript soldiers materializes out of the darkness. They aren't there to fix the truck. They're there to refuel and rearm the Mach 2 fighter jet that just landed on the road behind it. This wasn't a scene from a spy movie. For nearly three decades, this was Sweden's reality. During the Cold War, one nation in Europe stood neutral, but found itself stuck directly in the path of a potential superpower showdown of NATO and Warsaw Pact alliances. For Sweden at that time, a surprise attack wasn't just a possibility, it was practically a certainty. Planners in Stockholm knew that a single, overwhelming strike from the Soviet Union could wipe their entire air force off the map in minutes, shattering their concrete air bases before a single pilot could even scramble. But Sweden had a radical, almost unbelievable plan. What if your most powerful military air bases weren't bases at all? What if they were everywhere? And nowhere? To pull this off, they needed an entirely new kind of fighter jet. One that could take off from a highway and turn the entire country into a hidden, dispersed airfield. This is the story of the incredible machine built to make this plan come true. The Saab 37 Viggen. To understand why Sweden would commit to such an extreme strategy, you just have to look at a map. During the Cold War, Sweden's position was anything but enviable. Officially neutral, it shared a border with Finland, a nation living under the heavy influence of the Soviet Union, and sat directly across the Baltic Sea from the Warsaw Pact. This put Sweden on the front line of any hot war between NATO and the Soviets. So, Swedish military strategy was built on one grim assumption. An attack was not a matter of if, but when. The biggest fear was a knockout blow. Soviet doctrine favored overwhelming force and total surprise. A wave of bombers or missiles could strike Sweden's few concentrated airfields, destroying the air force before it ever left the ground. This wasn't just a theory. History had already shown how devastating such attacks could be. In 1941, during the opening hours of Operation Barbarossa, thousands of Soviet fighters were destroyed on their airfields, wiped out before they ever had a chance to fight back. The lesson was brutal and clear. An air force is only as resilient as the runways it depends on. Sweden, a nation fiercely proud of its armed neutrality, knew it couldn't count on outside help arriving in time. Its defense had to be self-sufficient and tough. After World War II, Sweden had one of the largest air forces in Europe and a world-class arms industry building its own jets, tanks, and submarines. But none of that would matter if they presented an easy, centralized target. The challenge was immense. How do you defend a nation when your enemy knows exactly where to find your most important assets? The answer wasn't to build stronger bases, but to get rid of the idea of a base altogether. The Swedish solution was a national strategy of mass dispersal, a concept known as BAS 60, and later the more advanced BAS 90. The idea was simple in theory, but absolutely staggering in practice. Instead of packing their air force into a few large, vulnerable airfields, they would scatter their squadrons across the entire country. In wartime, each squadron of 8 to 12 jets would deploy to its own hidden base, making it a pointless target for a massive attack. But these weren't just smaller airfields. The BOSS-90 system was a web of military infrastructure cleverly woven into the civilian world. The system's genius was its use of public roads. Specific stretches of highway were built extra straight, wide, and reinforced to serve as makeshift runways, some as short as 800 meters. In a crisis, they could be shut down and activated in minutes. The whole system was designed to survive through constant movement and deception. A single BOSS-90 base wasn't one place. It was a cluster of locations spread out over a huge area. It had a main runway, sure, but also several shorter backup strips and nearby road bases, all connected by taxiways that were often just regular country roads. Jets weren't parked in neat lines. Instead, individual parking spots were hidden and dispersed, sometimes hundreds of meters apart, deep in the Swedish forests. When a jet landed, a soldier on a motorcycle would guide it to a hidden service point. There, a mobile ground crew, 
mostly 19 and 20 year old conscripts with basic training, would be waiting in trucks and vans. Their orders, refuel, rearm, and service the aircraft in under 10 minutes, a process more like a Formula One pit stop than military maintenance. The most radical part of Sweden's dispersal system was these young people. In wartime, the survival of the Swedish Air Force depended on their ability to carry out these tasks, often at night and under harsh conditions. The system assumed there would be no perfect conditions and no margin for error. If the conscripts couldn't keep aircraft flying, the strategy would collapse. Even if an enemy destroyed one runway, the base could continue fighting from others. The entire country became a shell game, a network of secret airfields designed to ensure the Air Force would survive the first strike. To make this possible, they needed a jet designed specifically to operate under these extreme conditions. The first jet to really embrace this idea was the Saab 35 Draken, a revolutionary double delta wing interceptor designed for short field performance. Its innovative wing shape and high lift allowed it to operate from small runways and specially prepared stretches of highway, giving Sweden its first practical experience with dispersed air operations. While it was a formidable aircraft in its own right, the Draken was more a proof of concept than the final solution. The ultimate expression of the highway-based doctrine came with its successor, the Saab 37 Viggen, a name that translates perfectly to Thunderbolt. Development of the Viggen began in the early 60s with a list of requirements that seemed impossible. The Air Force wanted one plane to do it all, attack, fighter, and reconnaissance missions. It had to hit Mach 2 at high altitude, but also scream along at Mach 1 just above the treetops. And, most importantly, it had to take off and land on runways as short as 500 meters and only 9 meters wide, the exact size of the prepared highway strips. On top of all that, it had to be maintained by those young conscripts, meaning it needed to be rugged, reliable, and dead simple to service. To pull this off, Saab's engineers basically threw out the rulebook. The Viggen became the first combat jet with canards, small forward wings near the cockpit, to be mass-produced. This radical design was the secret to its incredible short takeoff and landing, or STOL, performance. The canards generated massive lift at low speeds, letting the Viggen leap into the air in just a few hundred meters and making it incredibly nimble right after takeoff. Powering this beast was a single, monstrous engine, the Volvo RM8. It was a heavily modified version of a Pratt & Whitney engine you'd normally find on a commercial airliner like the Boeing 727. Saab bolted on a massive Swedish-designed afterburner and, crucially, a unique thrust reverser, the only single-engine fighter ever to have one. On landing, the pilot would pull a handle, and as soon as the wheels touched down, three metal scoops would slam shut over the exhaust, blasting the engine's power forward. The pilot could then hit the throttle to bring the 20-ton jet to a screeching halt. This system was so effective, it even allowed the Viggen to taxi backward, a famous party trick at air shows. The plane was built like a tank. Landings were not gentle. Pilots were trained to slam the plane onto the runway without flaring, much like a carrier landing, which required incredibly tough landing gear. To help them hit those narrow roads, the Viggen was packed with a cutting-edge digital computer, one of the first in a production aircraft, and an advanced landing system. The entire aircraft was a purpose-built system, designed from the ground up to fight from the toughest places imaginable. The Saab 37 Viggen entered service in 1971, and for over 30 years, it was the backbone of Sweden's unique defense. While it never fired a shot in anger, its existence was a powerful deterrent. The Viggen, combined with the Bass 90 system, gave any potential enemy a tactical nightmare. Destroying the Swedish Air Force on the ground would mean hunting down individual jets scattered across hundreds of hidden locations an almost impossible task. The Viggen itself was a technological marvel, arguably the most advanced combat jet in Europe when it was introduced. Its once radical canard design is now standard on modern fighters like the Eurofighter Typhoon, the Dassault Rafale, and Saab's own successor to the Viggen, 
the JAS-39 Gripen. The Gripen is the direct descendant of the Viggen's philosophy. It's even better at operating from road bases, able to take off in 500 meters and land in 600. The rapid servicing idea also lives on. A Gripen can be refueled and rearmed for air-to-air -air combat by a small team in less than 10 minutes. With the end of the Cold War, the Bass 90 system was partially dismantled. But as global tensions have risen again, the core ideas of dispersal and resilience are making a major comeback, not just in Sweden, but in air forces all over the world. The U.S. Air Force's Agile Combat Employment concept is a direct echo of the strategy that Sweden perfected decades ago. The story of the Viggen and its highway air bases is a masterclass in clever, strategic thinking. Faced with an existential threat, Sweden didn't try to match its adversaries plane for plane. Instead, they changed the rules of the game entirely. They created a defense system that was resilient, adaptable, and woven into the very fabric of the nation itself. The Viggen, a jet born to fight from the most unlikely of runways, is a powerful testament to a small nation's fierce determination to defend itself, proving that sometimes the most effective weapon isn't the one you can see, but the one you can't find. If you enjoyed this look into a unique piece of aviation history, make sure to subscribe for more stories of incredible engineering. Thanks for watching. And Happy New Year 